commission meeting is called to order. Uh, ask that the chaplain, uh, chaplain uh, uh, Lee uh, Sean Duncan, um, if you if you're available, um, you could do the invocation. Yes, sir, I am available. Good afternoon, esteemed Board of Commissioners and guests. Father God, we just come to you today as humbly as we know how. We ask that you intervene in this meeting, Father. We ask that we be a community that serves the people. We ask and extend our blessings and greetings to you, Father, and ask that this community be given the opportunity by the board to serve with wisdom as well as humility, and that those that are coming forth to address their needs and concerns, Father, that they will be heard and that there will be a reconciliation to the issues and the problems that the board faces, that they will continue to strive to do what is best for the community and the city and the police officers at large. And we will continue, Father, to give your name, honor, glory, and praise as it is so due. And we say amen. Amen. Uh, and uh, let the record reflect that uh, our interpreters are not available today, uh, and uh, we apologize for that, and uh, hopefully uh, everything will be in order for next week. Mr. Chairman, please announce that there is no quorum, please. Uh, uh, absolutely. There is no quorum at, at this present time, and uh, I will uh, ask for a public comment to start. We Thank are you, Mr. Chair. A quorum. Oh, we are expecting a quorum, though. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll call the first three people. Former Commissioner Reginald Crawford, Bishop Bland, and Minister Eric Blunt. Yes, good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Reggie Crawford. I'm here on behalf of the uh, wrongfully convicted citizens. And the reason I'm, out, I'm here is because um, they're calling for, and the citizens of Detroit are calling for accountability. You can't have any justice without accountability. And those who were wrongfully convicted, uh, who were incarcerated for years on the Michigan prison plantation, some of them were able to escape, but they had to fight for that. Oh, ooh, they had to fight. All right. Okay. I'm about to snatch you off. I'm sorry. No, it's uh, not that. Uh, restore us two minutes. You, you, you just give them two whole minutes back. We we'll, we'll apologize for that. No, that's okay. She okay? You okay? No, I yeah, I'm good. I'm like Jesus. I'm sorry. What you didn't want to hear what I had to say? That's oh, I'm so no, sorry. I'm just, sorry. I'm, just, I'm, just <laughs> I'm just being facetious here. Yes, sir. You may be. But hurt. they had to. But they had to fight to get their freedom, and they fought. And uh, by the blessings of God, some of them are free today. Microphone. But there are many more who are in there. Uh, who were wrongfully incarcerated, and it all emanated from here, from the Detroit Police Department. You can't call yourself a constitutional police department uh, when there were things that violated other folks' constitution. Some of it goes back 10 years, 20 years, whatever, but, you know, those individuals, uh, two of them that I know of, spent seven years in prison and 21 years, and there are others. And also, when you talk about the civil liability of the citizens of the city, there's tens of millions that have already have been uh, won in those lawsuits. So simply the group, and I support the group, I'm with the group, is simply calling for accountability. Go back and charge those who engaged in criminality and putting them in prison. That's, you go back and charge them with crimes. Last I checked, you know, perjury is a felony. You know, you go up in the court, you don't testify, you test a lie. And that was the one issue. Uh, the second issue is the, uh, what I call political, uh, suspected political surveillance by DPD. And I asked uh, Chief Hollywood Craig years ago, as to whether or not they had a blue squad. Because as you know, or those of you who don't know, the history of the red squad, where they had political surveillance, surveillance on activists, surveillance on civil rights protesters years ago, uh, Coleman Young, former Ken Cockrell, the attorney, and many others in the city of Detroit, and they called it the red squad. And those names had to be revealed as to who. So today I'm calling to see if my name was ever on the list when I was police commissioner, Warfield, Sir, you were a police commissioner. You know about political surveillance. Uh, it was done to you under the Dave, Ming, Dave Bing administration. So it's just that simple. Was I ever politically or any commissioner or, or anyone politically surveilled? It, pardon me. That's a good song, too. Thought I had that cut off. <laughs> summertime. Uh -huh. Thought I had that cut off. Uh, pardon me. Uh, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Yes. 
Yeah. But I just want to know, uh, and that should be made, you know, it, it's easy for the police department to acknowledge it because something's been reported in the media. One last thing, I do understand social media, and that's all fair game. You know, it's what you do with it, though. You know, people put it out there on social media as to where they are, what they're doing, where they're eating. That's all public. It's made public then, but it's what you do with it. Okay. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you, would, would you like to address that? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair, if I may uh, bring up uh, Chief of Staff Commander Michael Parrish to uh, address that incident. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having me and through yes, you to the rest of the board. Uh, first, let me emphasize, is this thank microphone you. working? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, first let me em emphasize that right at the forefront of the department's surveillance directive is an opening that speaks directly to the First Amendment. That paragraph is there right at the start of the surveillance uh, directive for a reason. It's because we understand that surveillance, if misused, can impede anyone's First Amendment rights. First amongst the prohibited acts is any effort to collect, index, disseminate, uh, any information based solely on an individual's uh, right of assembly, their political beliefs, or anything more than who they are or what they believe in. So any conduct on that, uh, in that regard would be a clear violation of policy. We are aware of what has been suggested in the uh, news. We have responded to the news. We sat down and gave a very thorough, had a very thorough conversation with the person that wrote that article. We are disappointed that some of the things that we said were not included in the article. Uh, however, uh, media is what it is. But what I can assure the board is that the involved lieutenant's activities are being thoroughly investigated by the department's professional standards bureau. That uh, lieutenant that was uh, featured in that article has been suspended without pay and thank you to the, uh, for the support of this board in that regard. Every aspect will be investigated and appropriate discipline will be exacted uh, based on the investigation. So we hear the concerns loud and clear. We are doing our part to address them. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Bishop Bland, then Minister Eric Blunt. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, everyone who is here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Bishop Fletcher Bland, and I'm a lifetime Detroiter. Um, I wrote a letter to Chief White um, back in May of 2024, and um, I asked to suggest two campaigns, but before I do that, the handicap parking is at the end of the parking lot, and I'd like to suggest that the handicap parking be moved to the first two rows near the door, and that there be a handicap wrap in front of the door. Um, those of us who are physically challenged, um, that's a long way to walk, and especially the weather's going to get colder, and um, I would like to make that recommendation that the handicap parking be made closer to the door. Um, I have a campaign I would like to suggest regarding road rage. Um, it's an acronyms R O A D R A G E, retreat or another direction, resist and go elsewhere. I've sent this my third time making this recommendation to the uh, police department. As you know, there's a lot of road rage going on on Southfield Freeway and large freeways, and even in our neighborhoods. And I've talked to Mr. Jordan Hall, who is, I understand is retired, and uh, we're supposed to be putting some PSAs together to combat road rage. I did give Mr. Chairman uh, a copy of this, and hopefully um, I'd like to be part of the um, PSA and the um, issues that relate to it. The second item I'd like to suggest is um, get the digits. You know, there's a lot of stranger danger, a lot of kids have phones. They can take pictures of the perpetrator who's trying to get them to get in their cars or offer them candy. Another one can go behind the car and get a picture of the license plate. And uh, this will probably deter a lot of stranger danger and a lot of, and even when you're in an accident, somebody take off, get a picture of their license plate. And that's what I'm also suggesting as a campaign. Thank you. Thank you. If the, someone from the department can work with them, get this information and see what you can do to work with them, that'd be good. Mr. Chair, yeah. yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. I'm Minister Eric afternoon. Blunt from Sacred Heart Catholic Church right here in Detroit. Uh, 
Please don't be deceived by the department's listing of all of their policies and procedures and what might and might not be in violation of a policy or procedure. Because there's no consequence, there's no accountability. Even an officer's disciplinary history cannot be used in deciding their promotion. How seriously do you think they're going to, a, a bad cop is going to take their policies and procedures? None at all. Uh, Chairperson Woods, yes, it, sir. Didn't, it didn't take you long. It didn't take you long. <laughs> okay. To Give fall to, to fall into it, I see a resolution honoring a police officer. Really? <laughs> we had the Michigan Public Service Commission here this week talking about issues of DTE. There was not a minute spent on that Michigan Public Service Commission meeting about honoring DTE or any other public utilities employees. So we see where this is headed. It's a slippery slope. So once you start, I'm sure those that are in control won't let you stop. <laughs> Um, and that, that goes for uh, Commissioner Bernard. I'm sure the next promotion rounds you will solicit your personal and professional services to any police officer that's willing to take them. I was being very careful in my wording here today. Thank you. The cops, the ones that are bad, the one who murdered Sonia Massey was discharged from the Army for serious misconduct. The cop that brutalized Tyreek Hill was suspended six times before, once for 20 days. And right here in Detroit, Mrs. Robinson and her artistic son were brutalized by DPD with their license plates reader technology. How many times does DPD have to show that they cannot handle surveillance technology? Thank you, thank you. Are you sure? Take 10 more seconds. 10 more seconds. <laughs> Lieutenant Brandon Coles, his lawsuits clearly stated that Chief White has lied about who and how DPD uses surveillance tools and uh, on innocent uh, citizens. Thank you for the extra 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Seconds. Oh, seconds, what was the minute? It was minutes. <laughs> yes, uh, we have a quorum now. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, entertain a motion um, for the approval of the minutes. So move. Um, Second. Motion made. Point of order. Commissioner, do you want to do the introduction? Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I was going. I was cutting ten minutes. Huh? <laughs> Int introduction of BOPCs uh, or, or commissioners. <clears throat> commissioners, thank you. Yes. Commissioner Woods. Present. Commissioner Smith. Present. Commissioner Bernard. Attorney Linda Bernard, present. District 2. Commissioner Banks, excuse. Commissioner Bell, excuse. Commissioner Burton. Present on behalf of District 5 residents. Commissioner Carter, excuse. Commissioner Moore. Present. Commissioner Hernandez, Commissioner Presley. Here. And Commissioner DeWash is excused. Six present, sir, quorum. Okay. Now I entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes for September the 19th, 2024, or the agenda. So moved. Support. Um, a move by Commissioner Bernard, uh, supported by Commissioner uh, Moore. All in favor say aye. Aye. In discussion? Any uh, opposed? Uh, the ayes have it. Uh, entertain a motion uh, for the approval of the minutes uh, for September the 12th, uh, 2024. So moved. Uh, moved by Commissioner Bernard. Support. Supported uh, by Commissioner Moore. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any discussion? Anyone opposed? The motion is carried. Uh, introduction of BOPC staff, chief of police, elected officials, and the representatives and community leaders. Chief Investigator Jerome Warfield, Parliamentarian Dr. Francis Jackson, Mr. Robert Brown, Ms. Teresa Blossom, Ms. Janya Underwood, Ms. Artemisia Joshua, Ms. Mary Barber, Mr. Drew Fries, Acting Supervising Investigator Elgin Murphy. Court reported today is Joe Coleman, Sergeant Quinn for audiovisual, Charles Henry for media services video. 
and sitting in for Chief of Police Franklin Hayes. Elected officials, Ms. Marie Overall from State Representative Tyrone Carter's office, Ms. Freedia Butler, Second Precinct Community Relations President, Ms. LaDon Davis, Office of Council Member Fred Durall, Rod Thomas, Detroit Police Officers Association, former Commissioner William Davis, and former Commissioner Reginald Crawford, sir. Uh, thank you very kindly. To the chair. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, through the secretary, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Lamar Lemons, uh, former school board president of DPS, uh, who's present and who's joined the meeting this, this afternoon. Thank you. Um, and let the record reflect that uh, Commissioner Hernandez is present now. And uh, we have a, a, a resolution, a resolution honoring Sed Sergeant uh, Shirley Bledsoe. Uh, who just recently retired. Uh, you have that, Commissioner? Yes, I do understand, but is Sergeant Bledsoe here? No. Going once, going twice? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, then I'll keep my seat and simply uh, read the resolution, or I'll, I'll read a couple of the whereases and go immediately to the resolution part. Thank you very with kind. your permission. Yes. Um, just as a point of order, Shirley Bledsoe has been a police officer with the city of Detroit for 47 years. She's in charge of the neighborhood policing office at the 12th precinct. She's been there for many, many years and done a, a, a really good job. She's highly respected uh, throughout the 12th precinct and actually in District 2 as well. Um, this resolution goes into some detail about uh, when she was hired um, in 1978. She was laid off in 1979 and 1980 when we had no money in, in the Treasury, essentially. Um, she came back uh, in 1985. Um, she's displayed tremendous leadership and knowledge and was, pro and was promoted to investigator in 1998. Um, she earned the promotion to the rank of sergeant in 2004 and continued her education uh, and dedication, if you will, uh, to the Detroit community and to the department. She's been in the Western District and a number of other districts within the city. Um, as I said earlier, she's p played a, a pivotal role in strengthening the bridge between police, residents, and stakeholders as she tirelessly served the Detroit Police Department and its residents, visitors, and stakeholders. Therefore, be it resolved. That, that's the summary of all of this. Um, the Detroit Board of Police Commissioners, speaking on behalf of the residents of the great city of Detroit, recognizes and honors the lifelong contributions and commitment to excellence in public service of Sergeant Shirley Bledsoe. Her display of courage and unwavering community spirit has improved the quality of life in our city, and she is deserving of our best wishes in all of her future endeavors. We thank and congratulate you, Sergeant Bledsoe. Mr. Chairman, yesterday there was a, lunch, a luncheon for her at Northwest Activity Center. The chief was there. Of representatives from both unions were there, her entire staff of police officers who work in neighborhood protection, if you will, um, were there. I mean, uh, uh, um, um, council, not, not councilwoman, um, commissioner, um, the uh, lady commissioner, help me, you've got. Yeah, Irma Clark Coleman, that's what I was trying to think of. Uh, the, the county commission gave her a resolution and an award there. It was a very nice event. Uh, so, having said that, I move approval of this resolution, which we will give her, ladies and gentlemen, in this format. Mr. Don Johnson, who's head of the 12th Precinct, was supposed to be here today, but he had a flat tire. He called Teresa Blossom and told This is her resolution, and I move that it be um, adopted, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I move to adopt the uh, resolution honoring Sergeant Surly Blesso uh, by uh, Commissioner Bernard. Uh, is it a second? Uh, second uh, by uh, Commissioner Smith. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed or uh, any discussion? Uh, uh, anyone opposed? The motion is carried. It's passed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for your representation <clears throat> uh, there uh, for uh, Sergeant Blesso at the uh, um, Northwest Activity Center. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief of Police report. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to this honorable body. Uh, and those that are in attendance today, my name is Franklin Hayes, Deputy Police Chief, sitting in for our Chief uh, James White. I'd like to start with some statistics as to what's going on here in the city uh, and the work that we do uh, in making our city safe. Um, our crime, uh, violent crime, we, we, we know the stories and the narrative that we work collectively uh, with the police department, the community, and so many others uh, to, to drive those numbers down. We are still uh, achieving great success. Uh, evidence of that is some statistical data in these top uh, five categories are homicides. We were down 22% over last year. Uh, year to date, we had 193. This year, we are at 151 for 42 less victims of homicides here in our city. Non-fatal shootings. We uh, had 632 last year. Uh, we are at a 27% uh, reduction uh, in those numbers as well. Uh, where we've had 160, I'm sorry, this year we've had 463 <laughs> for 169 less fatal shootings. So collectively, we have 201 less families uh, that have been impacted by gun violence here in our city year to date over this time last year. Robberies, last year, year to date, we had 1,051. This year, we are at 817 for a 22 percent reduction or 234 less robberies and our carjackings. Uh, last year to date, we were at 124. This year, we are at 86, 31% uh, reduction, uh, and 38 less total victims of carjackings here in our city. So we continue to do the work, uh, and we continue, and, and it is our efforts to drive these numbers down even lower. As we know, some issues that have been uh, plaguing our community uh, that we seasonally see, uh, both drag racing, uh, and drifting uh, throughout our neighborhoods and city streets, uh, and also these uh, illegal street parties and these takeover parties that uh, we know tragedy has come from um, and really uh, had a few horrible incidents that happened, but uh, through uh, a, a, a technology or strategy that has evolved uh, from that tragedy, we have um, continued to make work, uh, do work in, in efforts to drive these numbers down. Just some statistical data of the action that we've taken since addressing both of these issues. We've made 102 felony arrests, four misdemeanor arrests. We've recovered 68 illegally possessed firearms. We've answered 565 police runs or calls for service. Of that, 433 of those were calls for these illegal street parties. We've issued two reckless driving tickets. We have uh, issued six drag racing tickets, and we've issued 66 uh, drag racing spectator tickets. Additional resources that we bring or address the needs of our community are our mental health uh, calls for service. Last week, uh, in the last seven days, we had 339 uh, calls for service that had a mental health nexus, whether it be mental uh, nonviolent, mental violent that's armed, mental violent that's not armed, uh, suicide in progress, or suicide threat. Uh, looking at our uh, calls for service year to date, uh, last year, we were at 11,761 calls with those nexus, with that um, nexus, I'm sorry. This year we are at 12,695, so we've had an additional 935 calls uh, for those that are in crisis. Uh, we work hard with our partnerships uh, through several external partners, and that initiative led by um, Captain Tanya Leonard, uh, certainly understanding how important mental health is to Chief White, uh, we will continue uh, to uh, address this issue, uh, looking for a solution, knowing that uh, mental health is not a crime and we certainly can't uh, arrest our way out of it, but uh, we will continue with these partnerships to get the help um, to those that are in need. Just want to share some significant incidents uh, with the community and yourself. I uh, want to start with a non-fatal triple shooting that occurred this Friday, uh, the 13th, uh, at 6, 16 p.m., where officers were dispatched to the 2700 block of West Davison to investigate a triple non-fatal shooting. Uh, officers arrived at the location and observed three victims suffering from gunshot uh, wounds. 
The victims were all transported to a local hospital where they were listed in temporary serious conditions. Officers from the 10th Precinct preserved the scene and detectives from the 10th Precinct Detective Unit uh, responded to the scene and processed accordingly and uh, got the information needed to start the investigation, but we need some help. Uh, we were able to determine that the victims were shot when three individuals wearing masks attempted to rob them, and we are asking for anyone with additional information regarding this incident, contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-SPEAK-UP or Detroit Rewards TV. Another incident that has uh, garnered quite a bit of media attention is involving a double fatal shooting that occurred this past Sunday uh, in the 2800 block of Russell or the Eastern Market, and that's when... Uh, Officers, while we're on patrol in the area, and we certainly know what has happened, but ultimately um, a shot was fired uh, that ended up in two victims suffering uh, fatal wounds. Um, the suspect was detained at the scene and transported to the Detroit Detention Center, where our homicide uh, ultimately uh, conducted an investigation and reported their findings and turned their findings over uh, to the office uh, of the county prosecutor. On September 17th, um, that, that was submitted on September 17th. On September 18th, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office um, declined to sign the warrant, uh, stating that this was um, lawful self-defense uh, by the shooter in this incident. Lastly, I want to share with you a fatal accident that occurred uh, Monday, uh, September 16th, at, uh, just before midnight, where officers were on patrol on the 9900 block of Gratiot uh, when it, this fatal accident occurred. There was a BMW traveling north on Gratiot uh, <coughs> that made a left-hand turn in front of a Dodge Charger, uh, striking the Charger and causing it to lose control. The Charger hit several parked vehicles and crashed into the entrance of the building. Uh, two uh, perished inside of the charger, and a third was transported to a local hospital and was being treated for injuries. The driver of the BMW was also arrested at the scene, and the detectives of the fatal squad were uh, who responded. Uh, we gathered the facts, uh, presented uh, a warrant to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office that is currently under review. Um, just a few positives as uh, this board uh, acknowledged the 46 years of service to the residents of the citizens of the city of Detroit by Sergeant uh, Shirley Bledsoe. Uh, we uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, very uh, amazing tenure here with the police department um, and wish her the best on her next chapter. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Lieutenant Quentin Maxey, uh, after 28 years, will uh, be having his retirement celebration as well uh, at the Sacred Heart. Uh, Activities building uh, located on uh, the uh, Mack and Rivard area. Um, there will be a graduation tomorrow um, for class 2024G at Greater Grace Temple, where we will have uh, just over 30 uh, graduates uh, joining the ranks and being sworn in uh, as members uh, of the Detroit Police Department. And then uh, an event that's uh, becoming an annual event that, that's growing in District 7, Commissioner Moore's district, uh, tomorrow from 12 to 4, where a, few, a free community block party to celebrate the neighborhoods uh, of the Detroit and Dearborn border, and that will be held at uh, Littlefield and Tyreman. We will be there in the community uh, recruiting and just uh, be all being neighborhood police officers, regardless of rank, and uh, uh, being out there with those that we serve. Lastly, I just wanted to uh, uh, update the community and just share um, uh, or update what's going on on an incident that has uh, garnered uh, some public attention in the media. Uh, the Detroit uh, Police Department uh, is aware of an article recently published in the Detroit Free Press regarding an individual filing a lawsuit against the city of Detroit regarding the seizure of her vehicle. After receiving a copy of the lawsuit, the chief directed internal affairs to conduct an investigation into the underlying circumstances, noting that the article was written almost entirely based on the complaint filed in the federal district court. The department can confirm that at this time there is no evidence that the internal affairs section had received a complaint uh, regarding this issue, and we also received information that no complaint had been filed with the Office of the Chief Investigator. Uh, the department has had conversations uh, with several, uh, I'm sorry, with, 
<clears throat> sorry, uh, the department has had uh, uh, conversations with uh, some of the commissioners uh, to discuss what we know um, regarding this matter and the commitment is made to the public that the internal affairs will be conducting the investigation as indicated and they will be conducting a thorough and complete investigation into the circumstances. The investigation will include, among other things, uh, the crime scene investigation. Why was information from the initial uh, incident, um, was it properly investigated? Uh, the collection of evidence was all evidence, including the vehicle processed according to DPD policy. Uh, was technology properly utilized in this case? Uh, was the initial detainment um, supported by the requisite level of suspicion? And was the vehicle, uh, the impoundment of the vehicle supported by the requisite degree of suspicion? And was this vehicle released according to DPD protocols? We are committed to providing an update on this investigation within 30 days, but we must be mindful that this matter is now the subject of litigation. Uh, at the conclusion uh, of that 30 days, again, when we provide that update, we certainly welcome the board's input and any policy revisions that may prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for allowing me to provide that report. Uh, that concludes it. Board members. Yes, sir. Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, D.C. Good afternoon, Commissioner Moore. My first question is the bailiff that shot Sherman Lee Butler, was he a former member of the Detroit Police Department? Uh, if I may, I'm going to defer to uh, Grant Ha, our chief legal advisor, to uh, address that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> the question in regards to the former, I'm sorry, the bailiff that was involved in the shooting? Correct. Was he a former member of the Detroit Police Department? Yes, he was a former member of the Detroit Police Department. Thank you. Is he a retired member or just a former member? I. I don't know. It was way before my time. Thank you. My next question is marketing plan. I, I had spoken with uh, Deputy Chief uh, Williams, and he forwarded to, I believe, Commander Parrish. The marketing as it relates to folks who've had their vehicles stolen, as, as it relates to them recouping monies for, that they've already paid to get their vehicles. Commander, can you speak to that? Uh, absolutely, Commissioner, uh, through the chair. Uh, anyone that believes they have been overcharged at any tow lot for any reason, whether it was uh, because a fee waiver was not provided when one was owed or because they just feel like there was a miscalculation of the fees, anyone can contact the Detroit Police Department Abandoned Vehicle Section to explain the situation. We will obviously have to verify the facts, but we will absolutely uh, process a refund for any amounts charged that should not have been. And my question is, Commander, is will there be some type of press release saying what you just said to the general public? So we already provided the information to the media, and I believe it was published an article, but we can certainly post something indicating that uh, if your vehicle was towed to any city of Detroit lot and you feel that you have been overcharged, that you can contact the abandoned vehicles section. I don't see an issue with that. I just think it needs to be updated or revisited, you know, because I'm sure it was provided. I know December 2022 with the mayor state and then you did some media a couple weeks ago in regards to it but it's not widespread it was through another news outlet but just to let people see that you're that dpd is proactive in addressing the issue that's i think that would go a long way with you know public trust okay as long as we're speaking to uh to that specifically you I just said what yep, you just said yep. thank you commissioner yep. and if you can um uh, forward that communicate to us to the board so we can share it as well and we can also upload that on our uh, website as well as our facebook page as well just you know put that information out thank you commander anything thank just you. one quick yes sir um is it with the commander no okay. i'm good thank you commander uh at the lions game not the not this Last game, but the week prior, are you aware that about 100 vehicles were broken into? Did you hear anything like that? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I have not uh, been made aware of that level uh, of BNEs happening uh, at that game. I can look into that and report back to this honorable body. And just very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. It was an issue that I know that you might be familiar with, Deputy Chief, in regards to communication where a citizen gave me some information and I gave it to the leadership of the Detroit Police Department, and it was a bad address, and this was in July. The 
problem was nobody told me it was a bad address. So every week the citizens tell me Detroit police ain't this, Detroit police ain't that, and I'm hearing this every week. <laughs> you know, so finally I broke down and I resent the email up the chain, and I got results. So I just want to say thank you. Absolutely. But I just think initially, if we would have known back in July that it was a bad address, it could have been resolved, and DPD didn't have to get all that flack, and I didn't have to hear all that. Mm -hmm. So thank you uh, uh, through the chair, and certainly we. Uh, like you, we are only as good as the information that we receive. So uh, the information that we got, we did go out and there was nothing <laughs> observed there. But if I would have known it was a bad address or that it was nothing, seeing a, a Remo, like y'all call me, it was a bad, we didn't see anything there. Then we could have addressed it two months ago. We will certainly verify uh, any information that we get. Uh, we take uh, crime and our citizens being victim of crimes uh, very seriously. So we will do that second verification for further inf info coming into us. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, and let the record reflect that Commissioner C Carter is present and as well as uh, our staff member, Jasmine Taylor, is online as well. Uh, any other commissioners? Yes. Uh, also, Commissioner. Speak, speak. Uh, I, I, I said I, I already acknowledged I, I him hear, already. I didn't hear that you said Hernandez. Yes. I was going to let him speak his for himself. What, the gavel? No, <laughs> okay. I didn't hear, I didn't hear uh, you mention him. All right. Uh, you had a question? But, yes. Um, a couple of things, um, uh, Chief Hayes. The first thing is that um, apparently Wayne State University is doing a de-escalation training, a national de-escalation training um, that is being offered for three two-day training sessions for law enforcement that are interested. Shouldn't that be you have other trainings that are mandatory? Shouldn't that be a mandatory training? I'm sorry, through the chair, I'm missing a question. Are, are you saying what's what's being mandated at Wayne State Police? No, I'm saying why aren't our officers being mandated to go to the to the national de-escalation training? Um, it's a two-day training session that apparently I guess we're doing it here, but it's up it's up to officers to volunteer to go. It's one of the administrative messages uh, that yeah. sent out. It's one of the ones that are important, right? It, well, with any training, uh, through the chair, with, with any training that's offered nationally, um, members may take advantage of it. What I can tell you and share with you is that not only with, uh, as evidenced in the uh, 30 plus recruits that will be graduating tomorrow, as well as our annual uh, recertification training, and through our teletypes and administrative messages, uh, de-escalation uh, is, is an important tool that we have in our tool belt, and we teach that, we push that down, and this was some bonus or, or some added uh, training and opportunity, but saying that, that de-escalation is a core value in our tactics, and uh, despite what's going on at Wayne State, we teach that here uh, in DPD as well. Okay, all right, and there was one other point. The, um, um, you're also doing another training on mental health issues. Is, is, is mental health training part of the standard training that everybody gets, or is this something else that's optional as well for officers who may want to participate? Uh, through the chair. So mental health training uh, is a part uh, of of all of our curriculum, all of our training. It's taught at the academy, whether it be mental health first aid. Uh, so there is a level of mental health training, including the command staff that have taken it. There are an additional levels that uh, that members may take if they are perhaps a part of our mental health co-response unit. There's additional training that officers can take, uh, and this is just that. But there is a baseline curriculum of mental health training to all members of the police department. May I suggest that, that maybe maybe you do it in the precincts or something else, but that you do a refresher on that at least once a year, for so that everybody is current on it. Since it's such become such a huge area, such a major part of, of your report every week, I think it may be helpful just to have that refresher maybe once a year. But my final point, uh, question really relates to your administrative message regarding um, payment for standby. Officers, would you mind explaining uh, to our, to the community what's what standby, what this means, in, that, in terms of what the department is doing? I'd never heard the term before, personally. Through the chair, I would like to uh, bring up our chief legal advisor, okay. um, Grant Ha, to speak to this contract language. All right, have at it. Through the chair, uh, second deputy chief Grant Ha, in regards to your question in regards to standby time, can you speak up a little bit so everybody can hear? Sure. Standby time is time that is uh, afforded to a member when the member has to be on standby in regards to possibility of being recalled. If the member is recalled, then 
at the time that uh, they're on standby, they're not supposed to be associating with um, individuals while they're, so they sacrifice their time in regards to not imbibing um, alcoholic beverages. They have to be ready at any time to be recalled in case they are recalled. So you're notified ahead of time that you're standby, so you can't have a beer or yes, that's correct. you have to be in uniform, it says. You have to be on standby. Okay. So you have to be ready to be recalled at any, at any moment. Any, anything further? Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions? Um, through the chair. Yes, sir. Um, um, questions for the, um, um, the chief. Uh, after talking with uh, uh, many of my constituents in the seventh precinct um, in the fifth district, uh, when it comes to the the Eastern Market uh, incident, uh, we like to uh, make a request to have uh, the mounted unit um, to go, um, you know, to go out and assist um, at tailgate parties and stuff in the Eastern Market area with number seven. Uh, also, many of our constituents in the seven precinct and down in Easter Market uh, applaud um, the seven precinct for um, you know for for good policing for policing that area uh, for many years without any incidents. Uh, just a quote from um, um, former Assistant Chief uh, Steve Dolan. He once said that uh, DPD cannot police stupidity, and uh, and it's clearly um, this um, perpetrator from Oakland County coming down into the Eastern Market uh, was um, the stupidity on, on that person's um, on on their on that person's behalf was definitely uh, stupidity. But uh, the MPOs does a great job in uh, keeping that area safe um, in the uh, Eastern Market area. Um, recommendations, once again, is to have the mounted police unit um, to come and assist those officers. Um, we don't have any you know, situations or incidents like that. Um, um, it's definitely sad to see something like that happening um, in, 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 in our city and our district and our precinct, but uh, we definitely um, like to make a recommendation to have the mounted police uh, unit to come and assist doing those um, on the weekends. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, through the chair, so <clears throat> absolutely a tragic incident, but uh, if I can share with this entire body, uh, not only the mayor, but uh, the chief as well, uh, has uh, has a strong conviction that the bad actors uh, will not uh, uh, impact or impair or stop a tradition that has gone on for many years. Um, uh, let that stop. Let that impact it. So uh, the direction, uh, as you mentioned, the work that's being done currently, Commander Johnson, Javon Johnson, uh, as well as the MPOs who you— uh, uh, make it a point, if I may, uh, Commissioner Burton, to acknowledge their work every time there's a community event uh, in your precinct, as uh, do certainly your colleagues and other members of this board. Uh, but we've been involved with the Eastern Market leadership. Um, and the request for mounted, we will certainly put that in. There's a rotation, but we will make sure that the horses are visible uh, during tailgating events. Don't know how long. Some of it's weather-based. It gets a little cold during tailgating season, but we can have uh, the uh, the horses out. Uh, in addition, they are working on a safety plan. Um, and that came out out in the media as well, and we are involved uh, with, as it relates to some increased presence down there. Um they, they will reconfigure that campus area, and one of the things that they will be doing is adopting what has been done at other large events throughout the city. Uh, there's going, they are looking at making it a uh, firearm-free campus uh, during that time. So we are working uh, with, uh, again, the Eastern Market and other city uh, entities to make sure that the tradition of tailgating does go on in this city uh, and at the request of your constituents and residents uh, um, in that area, we will make sure that the horses make an appearance as well in that effort. Mr. Mr. Chair, thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, uh, Chief, and I will definitely re uh, relate that back to my uh, constituents and uh, number five and also um, um, to the businesses in, in, um, in the Eastern Market. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Okay, you say a tradition. I know Cooley High School, they traditionally have their get-togethers, and it was broken up this year. So 
I understand downtown and you know traditions of tailgating, but what about the neighborhoods and Cooley High School and those events that were broken up this year? Uh, through the chair, so uh, as a, uh, one of the events that we talked about, or I, I reported on earlier, the tradition of the block party, uh, the Detroit and Dearborn border. Say that to say that we certainly support. Uh, gatherings uh, and everyone having a good time. It just needs to be uh, some order. Um, to the Cooley event that you mentioned, taking over a city street, ballroom hustling in the middle of a street, buses can't get by, people can't go to work, that's not okay. Again, we certainly support people getting together, have a good time. Uh, as I often joke and say, even if it's for our own personal interest, we need to know where a party is so when we do get off, we can go enjoy it ourselves. So we are not about breaking the parties up and stopping everyone for have a good time, but it needs to be uh, a bit of order uh, and we will support those events we will bring resources if we can there's a request for metal detectors the magnetometers we will deliver the evolve at no charge if there's a traffic plan if we have barricades or bike racks we will help that as well but we are committed uh, uh, to the party we want the party to go on but it, but it has uh, to be in an orderly fashion so just and just just very quickly so proactively speaking if Cooley's gonna have their party in 2025, how about DPD reach out to them proactively to try to get those things squared away? Thank you. Uh, and yeah. Great, great point. And we are working uh, with uh, the mayor's office, uh, Jessica Parker, the uh, deputy uh, COO of the city, uh, and a few others, Council Member Gabriela Santiago Romero, uh, as well to educate uh, those that will be hosting large events, or not even large, but medium sized events, anyone that wants to host an event to talk about the permitting process, what that looks like. You know, if there's an impact of traffic, what needs to be done, what communication needs to be go, uh, be given or had with those that, uh, that are stakeholders stakeholders in the area. It could be residents, if it's a block party, if it's at a venue, talking to that venue holder, everything from capacity with the fire marshals, making sure that the venue is safe, that there's fire suppression, that there's a way in and a way out, that the place, the venue is structurally sound. So we are working. We will have that conversation coming up uh, for the 2025 uh, event season. So uh, we are committed to doing just that, Commissioner Moore. Thank you, yeah. Chief. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and so that's the alumni groups uh, that you referred to. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. Just uh, very quickly. Real quickly, um, uh, Chief. The um, one thing is a rumor that I need you to tell me if it's true or not. The people, the two people that were uh, shot at at uh, Eastern Market, it was my understanding it was just one bullet and went through one person into another. Is that true? Uh, through the chair, that uh, the, the investigation has led to those. The, that was a finding that was submitted to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. That's what it appeared to be. Okay, second, real quick, you mentioned um, holidays and uh, events that are coming up. The Mexico's um, Independence Day, I think, is coming up. Is it October, November, something? No, I'm wrong? Someone just told me this. Oh, I know Cinco de Mayo, but this is a different one. No, 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 that's so different. Days ago. Oh. In the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Preston. No, I didn't know. Right, so uh, my question uh, may be a, a tag team question between the chief investigator and uh, Deputy Chief Hayes. Uh, uh, you know, it has been stated a number of times that one of the challenges that we have uh, in policing is when uh, law enforcement officers go to different agencies, uh, but their history uh, doesn't necessarily follow them there. And I have reviewed a couple of uh, citizen complaints uh, where the uh, allegations of misconduct were sustained. Uh, however, uh, it was notated that these individuals are no longer a part of the department. Uh, and so in cases where uh, there's a um, allegation of misconduct that's sustained, but the individual is not a part of the department, uh, what is done to, want to keep record of that, or does that follow that individual if they indeed uh, continue in uh, law enforcement capacity? Uh, if if I may, so um, we certainly keep track of that. Uh, Come on up, Ha, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> we certainly keep track of, uh, regardless if they have left, uh, if, if there is sustained misconduct, we will keep that in the file um, because we have those that uh, may try to come back. So we certainly keep uh, a record of that. Um, a, as far as, and I will certainly turn this over to D.C. Ha, one of the things that helps us, and I know this body is, is working diligently through, but the timeliness of the, uh, the, the investigation 
allegations for citizen complaints. That way we can get that updated so that it can be in their file uh, in case they leave and it can follow them to that other agency. But sometimes if there's a long lapse um, in the event uh, that a matter is adjudicated or the case is investigated, they may have been gone and been hired already. And it is not that we um, acted in good, I mean, acted in bad faith or we actually acted in good faith, but we were only as good as the information we could provide to those other agencies. And at the time, those matters uh, had not, again, been. So, so the there's there's supposed to be an affidavit uh, when the person uh, leaves that goes to MCOS, uh, and that affidavit is, is supposed to say that they left uh, under investigation or uh, under discipline and things of that nature. You on MCO, you represent MCOS, right? Mr. Oh, Chair, I do. I do not. So at this point, I'm yeah. going to turn. Uh, uh, to okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, through the chair, the second deputy chief Grant, uh, I'm yes, sir. the chief's representative on MCOLS. And yes, you are correct. Under the Michigan Law Enforcement Separation Records Act, there is supposed to be an affidavit indicating why the member separated. So if a member separated under good standing, there's going to be information in regards to the fact that the member left in good standing. If the member left not in good standing, if the member was terminated, if the member resigned under um, criminal charges, or if the member resigned under like uh, internal investigations, there's a uh, multiple um, series of um, possibilities or choices that you have to check off or circle. And that is what we put in. We put in the affidavit and we also put the, down the circumstances under which the officer separated from the department. Are we updated and current on those affidavits with MCO? We are updating the ones that were done in the past as it's coming up but we are current in regards to the separation as it's going forward. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, uh, to your point, D.C. Hayes, I definitely recognize that, you know, uh, some of the um, lapses in our timing in completing these investigations have made it difficult, but that's kind of what I'm getting to because I'm sure that these processes are in place uh, when we have timely investigations completed, uh, but in the instance where uh, these are investigations that have lapsed that one year mark and we don't know whether or not that individual is in law enforcement again. Is there any mechanism that tracks what has been sustained allegations to uh, update or whatever file might follow them in any uh, law enforcement agency they might be a part of? A chief investigator through the chair. Through, through the chair. Um, one of the things our office uh, made a commitment to do is to make sure that, especially when those um, officers are no longer part of the department, that we maintain that record, we maintain this, this sustain in their record, and we pass that information along to disciplinary. Um, disciplinary keeps ra a record of that as well, because as um, Deputy Chief said, we do know that many uh, do come back to the department, and we want that there. Um, so that the department understands that uh, when they left, and unfortunately we're catching up um, um, on those uh, records that, that are older than a year, uh, but we still want the information documented so that the department has a clear understanding of who's coming back to them uh, seeking employment. In uh, Deputy Chief Howe, one more time. Uh, because the, the question is, once he's finished that, do that affidavit, do you guys do the affidavit you know, to, to make it catch up? No. So again, through the chair, second deputy chief grant yeah second deputy uh, chief so i'm uh, just trying to go through the formalities so in regards to whether it's caught up if the member separates at the time that that information is the affidavit at the time that the member separated however the hiring law enforcement agency by law has to do a thorough background investigation and when they come to the former law enforcement agency they have a waiver from the officer that is trying to go to the new agency and the waiver says, go ahead and release all the information. Once that's produced to us, then we're supposed to provide all of that information, including any updated information. Yeah, because I know what is the fine when a department do not uh, inform uh, MCOs of the uh, disciplinary? Well, that's something that it's, it's, I think is going to be part of a new legislative uh, bill. Right. Yeah. Um, that is, so um, we're trying to make it 10,000. I'm on that uh, 
I, I'm in real time on that committee right now with Senator Chain. Right. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that that was a very, very good question. And that's why you might wonder, Twin, because I was, uh, <laughs> uh, was going to ask that question, um, because that's vitally important that we are updating those affidavits and staying current. Uh, uh, on those affidavits to MCOs. And for, uh, for people who don't know what MCOs is, would you let them know what that is? It's the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. It's the oversight body for all law enforcement agency within the state of Michigan. We set the standards in regards to how a member is hired, how the member is to be separated, um, all the, the conditions and certifications required to, uh, for the member to be a licensed law enforcement officer. So to your point in regards to the separation, the current talk is in regards to fines all the way going up to the possibility of superintendent control by MCOLs in regards to an agency that fails to do a thorough background investigation if they intentionally or deliberately fail to do so. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah. Are, you, are you done? All right. Hey, yeah. Make all a follow-up right. point. Two seconds. You don't tell anybody else two seconds. I got to anyway. tell you, you're going to make it five. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, no, I, I think the, the follow-up just for our, 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 our community is simply that, for your information, the George Floyd Act would have made it mandatory that every police department in the country and every law enforcement entity create a statewide and national registry where if like Linda Bernard was a cop yeah. here and then I went to California, I, you know, they, the whole record, my whole record would be there. That did not unfortunately pass uh, in, in Congress. But that's the point. But Michigan doesn't have a national re a statewide registry, do we, no. Officer Ha? Not yet. Um, there's, there's a uh, um, Senator Chain has police accountability bills that is in that uh, that I'm on a committee. A lot of uh, community organizations is being represented there, pushing very hard to get this legislation passed, and we're hoping to get it passed before the end of the year. So it behoove uh, everybody in this community to advocate strongly uh, to get the police accountability bills passed, uh, so that we can have that registry and we have our form of the George Ford uh, uh, Act here in the state of Michigan, you know, so um, uh, thank you, uh, Second Deputy Chief, and um, my, my uh, final statement to the uh, Chief is that, you know, I appreciate uh, the administration um, uh, having a briefing. We had a briefing earlier. It was, it was myself, Commissioner Bernard, as well as Commissioner Smith, and uh, we was trying to get Commissioner Moore there, but he had an emergency uh, at, at the job, and we're going to make sure that every commissioner get briefed that want to be briefed in, as, as relates to uh, what happened uh, in the uh, situation with the young lady and her two-year-old son. Um, uh, we're, we, we are very, very pleased that the department is uh, moving very swiftly on this. As soon as, as soon as it was brought to their attention and as soon as it was brought to our attention, uh, we uh, recognized that we didn't have a citizen complaint on file in this particular matter, and, and they didn't have a, a turn affairs uh, complaint either. Um, but are very committed to making sure that uh, this be a very open and transparent matter and that uh, the community be fully briefed on this uh, on, on this matter uh, as as soon as possible, uh, based upon um, all of the legal situations that's involved here. So I want to say that and um, uh, moving on right along to um, the presentation to the board, I believe, or, or communication. Or, or presentation, yeah. Mr. Yeah, Chief. or communication. We can finish that. Thank you, uh, Second Deputy Chief. Attorney. He's an attorney. Second Deputy <laughs> Chief. He's also attorney. Click it a ticket. <laughs> um, I'm just telling you. All right. Uh, or communications. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have 12 speakers. We'll start with Ms. Tara Brown, after Ms. Brown, Lamar Lemons, and Ms. Glenda McGatney. Good afternoon, Commission. Thank you very much, Commissioner Moore, for asking that question, because I've been badgering y'all with it for several weeks. Yes. And in preparation of speaking tonight, I was going to bring to your attention a lawsuit I picked up this afternoon just before this meeting, case number 01126255NO, Craig Gregory. 
and it's from 1999 when he was on the police force and there was a gentleman that sued him, Mr. Griffin, because on December 14th, 1999, Mr. Griffin and one of his coworkers borrowed the vehicle of another coworker to go home. He was driving, the other coworker was driving one of them home. They got stopped by the police. Neither one of them could re produce registration for the vehicle. They were arrested. They were arrested and the lien wasn't working. So essentially they were detained. After being detained, they were released the next day, and the gentleman that sued, Mr. Griffin, had on a brand new leather jacket. When he went to retrieve the leather jacket, it says in the suit, Detroit Police Department could not produce it. Of course, he got mad, because it's the wintertime. It was December 14th. It says, as plaintiff walked out the door of the precinct, Detroit police officers Craig Gregory, Benito Mendoza, and other identified officers attacked Mr. Griffin, punching and kicking him about the head, face, and body, and continued to beat Mr. Griffin after he was down on the ground. Plaintiff Griffin was then hogtied by the officers and placed in a bare concrete cell where Plaintiff Griffin lay until he complained about chest pains. He was then transported to Detroit Receiving Hospital where he was treated for his physical injuries that were inflicted by Detroit police officers. Plaintiff was then charged with a crime of disorderly conduct, which was later dropped by the Detroit Police Department. And he then went on to sue. The city offered him $500. Of course, he didn't take it. And he ended up suing the city for thousands of dollars. And at some point, there was a settlement. This is the person that went into Sherman, Baylor, Sherman Butler's house and shot him. And I believe that because he was a former Detroit police officer, that is the reason that we are getting no transparency on this case. I have repeatedly asked and asked about this video that should have been shown to us a long time ago. Imagine all the stuff I would not have found if they'd have just showed the video. Now, I've been out here looking on my own. I have found the names of the officers. I have gotten the 911 call. I'm a disabled person from my living room. I'm doing all of this from my living room. I am investigating a case Final that I should have been seconds. able to watch on television. We need transparency on this issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, you can give my two minutes. Uh. Uh, next. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can the chief respond? Or can you get somebody to look into that for her? Pardon me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hold on. Um, next, next speaker. I don't see Mr. Lemons. So the next person would be Miss Glenda McGatney. All right. And then, af and then after Mr. McGatney, I had Miss Williams and Miss Smith. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You might Good be evening. heard. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Glenda McGatney, and I'm a 73-year-old resident of the city of Detroit. And I've been having some problems. My neighbor is Caucasian. He's Mark uh, Coulson, and he has been attacked more than once by Calvin Wilson. And um, this neighbor has... Calvin Wilson has continued. Can, can you not uh, say names? But they wanted their names said. That's the reason why I'm saying their names. My neighbor, Mark okay. Colson, wanted it's, his name said. I'm sorry. Okay, let me move on. Thank you. Because it's limited time. Oh, uh, no, we'll give you 30 more seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a probation. Re restart our time. The restart probation, our time. The probation ends on uh, December the 24th. And. Um, this neighbor has also come into my driveway. I have come before this board three times. Officers have called me, have not called me, have not followed up. I am not happy. Uh, Labor Day weekend, this same neighbor kept me up, as well as our other neighbors, for more than 12 hours, and I ended up sleeping in my car. A 73-year-old senior should not have to sleep in their car because of safe, safety. And Mark Colson has, I know, I'm sorry, my Caucasian neighbor has been uh, harassed for more than four years. I have been harassed for several months. So what are we going to do about this? Do we have to call Fox 2 News? Uh, I would not like to go there. There's been a lot of videotape uh, on this individual, and uh, nothing has been done. Uh, like I said, uh, the probation period ends up uh, December uh, 2024. Um, and um, he has uh, some type of mental, emotional problems. 
last time he should have been taken to the hospital, police didn't come for almost 12 hours, and I'm in the 10th precinct. And they, even when I drove up there, they told me to go back home. There was nothing they could do. They could have taken him to the hospital. He needs help, and we need help. Thank you. Thank you. Did we get the information? Yeah, they get someone, they have it. Somebody from our complaint. All right, all right. Uh, next speaker. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> um, last week when we had a community board of commission meeting out in uh, southwest Detroit, the question I wanted to ask when I was speaking about the police officers that's in the shelter where I reside at, um, the undercover officers, can you guys hear me? Thank you. Okay. Um, I continue to come here every week concerning my well-being and my safety and my safety being in danger every day when I leave out this facility. That's number one before anything. But I want to know, why is the taxpayers paying for officers that's in there for this one person that did all this illegal stuff in my life and involved in a federal UPS robbery. Why are they protecting this woman? I mean, constantly police officers are in there and you cannot tell me they are not in that facility. I don't care what nobody says. You want to talk about mental illness. I believe the officers that on 2,700 officers that's on this force, they should be um, checked for mental screen, seeing what's going on with they, how they think and they logic, and drug testing. Let's talk about some real stuff. It's okay for them to come out here every day and disrespect they oath and they badges constantly and violate my constitutional rights in that facility. <clears throat> like I said, Frank, he is an officer of this, he works here. He left out the facility yesterday. But this is the same officer who threatened me with a Draco. That's not acceptable, period. And what you guys gonna do about it? You sit behind these chairs every, I mean, every week I sit up. Like this officer here. Officer was promoted. Jasmine, when promotion, she's in that facility. I can't make this up. Have a good day. Thank you, next speaker. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, DC Hayes, uh, I, I think we had this conversation some time ago and it was stated that there are no officers at that shelter. Is it possible that uh, the shelter could be hiring officers through secondary employment? And if so, would, what would be their attire uh, to identify themselves? Through, through the chair, I will check, but uh, since our last conversation, I have confirmed that uh, we do not have a contract for police services at secondary and under no circumstances would a member working secondary employment be other uh, than in uniform, perhaps business attire, and those uh, instances require a sign-off by the chief, and that has not occurred. There have been no requests. Uh, I can check back to see if they have hired secondary, but again, if it would, they would be in uniform. There are no secondary undercover uh, assignments uh, in the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Commissioner Carter, I missed you last week. Uh, I had a message from my son-in-law for you. <laughs> anyway, I live in the area of Eastern Market. It was horrible what I saw on TV and the fact that what my son-in-law told me, because he has a group of men that uh, football, you know, supporters, and they always get together every time the football, and they feed each other, and he does the cooking and have the TV. Sometimes he has it in his home there on Oakland Boulevard. Now, my suggestion, since I'm that close to the area, and I do go there, and I bank there right on the corner, that you would have each one of those, um, who, what do you call them, that has the, the cooking and so forth, you would have uh, a name, their names and IDs. I thought about this. And this way, any confusion that's there,
that you can go directly to them because it's a, I don't want to say what I want to say. It's a de-shame that we can go and have a good time without carrying guns. I, I'm, I'm disgusted about this. It looked like everyone you, you, you have com, uh, any kind of confusion about, they got a gun. Why? Isn't there no way to talk anymore to each other or walk away? That's what I suggest. Walk away if it gets so bad. But the fact is, we got guns every time you look up. I'm so sick and tired of looking at my news at 11 o'clock. It's guns, guns, guns. Now, my suggestion, since I do live in the 5th District, that we would have the directors of the Eastern Market have the garbage cans there, because it was horrible to look at all the filth that was left there the next day. We live in a good city, but we got to treat it that way. And I cannot understand for the life of me, and as old as I am seeing all this going on in my city. I went to Chicago, and I saw what was going on over thank, there. Thank We're you, Ms. Smith. I'm through. That's time, yes. Oh, God. Our next speaker will be Mr. Right. Ronald Foster. Just do better. Foster. That's all I say. Yes, ma'am. And then after Mr. Foster, we'll go into Zoom. You may be hurt. Good afternoon. Good Through afternoon. To the chair, first off, um, I do support Police Accountability Act, Senate Bill 473 through 484. Secondly, um, personally, this week I had two incidents in the third precinct. Um, I think I'm pretty fair and open with things. Um, a failure to report a crime, demeanor, failure to provide adequate grievance process, failure to de-escalate. And so um, I'm really not into filing grievances. I think things could be handled at the lowest level, being prior service myself, and I don't want to add to an overload caseload already. Um, secondly, I went to court hearings this week. Three victims. One was a young lady that was a gunshot victim last week. One was a senior lady, and one was a senior male. And on both cases, they both requested crime victim rights and compensation, of which they knew nothing about. We have to, it's the, it's, it's the law. We have to enforce crime victim rights. Thirdly, Brady Act, I'm still asking for that. Over the week, we had another police officer, former Detroit police officer, with a history of issues including sexual misconduct. So um, I'm glad that um, the detective, when I did ask him for the crime victim rights on behalf of the citizens and LaShore precinct that he was able to provide some information. Just quickly, a perspective moving forward, retaliation or self-preservation, there is a difference. There's more self-preservation than retaliations. Citizens and people do not surrender their natural right to self-preservate. Most retaliation can only occur if the original offense is not caught. And so I've never heard of anyone breaking into jail or prison to do anything to anybody. And so um, we have to do better about that and understand in that perspective the difference between retaliation and self-preservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Deputy uh, Chief uh, Hayes, can you uh, talk about, I, I know there's a, um, there was a major meeting today, and I'm sure it'll be publicized as it relates to uh, making sure that voices of uh, those who have been victimized, in particular by homicide, are getting better response. We have been working with the department for some time now, and um, uh, I know it was a, a slew of homicide victims here uh, earlier today, of those who have been victimized by homicide here earlier today, and then there was uh, uh, the new captain, Captain Thurko, and the commander has been uh, uh, hitting the ground running in terms of engaging on uh, making sure that those families are getting responses and, and getting the care that they need. Can you talk about that that new new and fresher approach? Yes, uh, absolutely, Chair. Um, so Chief White had the opportunity to meet uh, with some of our victims uh, and the families uh, of those that have been impacted by violent crime and saw that there was an area of opportunity to do more and, and be better. Uh, from that, uh, we have a, a commitment to a timeline that we will follow up, which each of our victims, to give them a case note, certainly 
it may not always be uh, the information that they want to hear, that we found the person responsible, but uh, it will not be silence. So we are working with that uh, up to and including identifying some new staff. There is going to be now an entity of the department that is committed to doing just that, not a detective that uh, uh, will get around to it or with the caseload that's going, it, the, the caseload makes it virtually impossible. This is a priority uh, with, with feedback and with continued dialogue to dialogue to our victims' families. Uh, so more to come. Uh, my understanding is that there will be a presentation. Um, uh, in speaking with the chief, he wants to do more than what was even discussed at the meeting. So this is uh, something that's paramount to Chief White, uh, and this program will certainly increase that conversation and those updates. Absolutely. And I want to acknowledge uh, Bishop Harris that's here from Ceasefire, uh, uh, who's now under the, um, the um, what, you, what department you guys are? Health department now. Uh, and so thank you for your leadership. We was at the candlelight vigil uh, for the gentleman uh, this past week, and uh, that's a horrific situation, but the, the community is there. I live in that district as well, uh, and um, uh, we, we as a community need to continue uh, to lift up what uh, Mr. Foster said in terms of those who have been victimized, but uh, also what former Commissioner Crawford talked about, there's a balance there's a, there's a balance there in terms of those who have been victimized uh, um, by the police as well, you know, uh, and so uh, it's a double-edged sword, and we're committed to making sure that there's answers on both sides, and I'm very, very pleased to see that the process Prosecutor budget uh, uh, for the conviction integrity unit was doubled, uh, and that uh, uh, is she publicized and made it a priority uh, for some of those cases that uh, that folks been advocating about here. Uh, that they would take a deep dive in that uh, once everything is approved uh, with her budget uh, finally signed off on by the um, uh, um, Mr. Evans. Uh, and uh, we have been talking offline about that as well, you know, and she will be making a presentation uh, to this board in the first week of uh, October. Again, this board is not uh, just here, you know, twirling its uh, 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 fingers, you know, but we are very, very actively working, and we will be um, um, asking you guys uh, to come to a, a press conference that we will have very, very soon about a transparency that you guys are going to love. That's the only thing I can say about it right now, but we will be ready to launch something very, very, very good that this uh, community is going to love. All right. Uh, thank you very kindly. Um, um, next speaker. We're going into Zoom now. Um, our first speaker will be Black Bag Roo, Election Integrity Roo, Margarita Maddox, and iPhone. Uh, you may be heard. <clears throat> Now, as I sit here and debate whether I come on as election integrity rule, because I done busted them, cold busted, Department of Elections, Gina Edward Walker, Dennis Winfrey, Daniel Baxter, Chief of Detroit Elections, still two irrefutable current ironclad concrete evidence and proof. It is what it is. And then also made it got it for made sure it got in 45 hands. He got proof, positive. Ironclad, irrefutable, still too concrete, bare trap proof that he was cheated on in the 2020 elections now. Man, living victims of absentee ballot fraud, pervasive, pervasive, rapid throughout the state of Michigan, I found out now. They wasn't just doing it in Detroit, they was doing it in other cities too. 2024 is about to be what it's about to be. But there was, and this board voted to subpoena that record, the one that's going to prove to Nene that her mama didn't shoot herself. And it's going to prove it in not the way the Michigan State Police thought, but from what I found out. Now, you went in the next Friday morning, you saw the board's directive, which was to Subpoena the record from the Detroit Police Department, and you come up with this poppycock and send a letter over to the Michigan State Police because you've been talking to them, and that's all you got to do. It's, well, it's been weeks, man. Nene still ain't got what she wants. 
So now I'm getting ready to reduce this whole city to rubble. This election fraud. And Detroit has become the epicenter. In the United States of America, these United States of America of election fraud, voter fraud, and absentee ballot voter fraud, and I put the whole 40 years on it, the whole four decades. They call me Black Bag Rue. Thank you very kindly. Next speaker. Ms. Maddox. We'll go to the next speaker and go back to Ms. Maddox. Okay. We're going to go to iPhone. Hello. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Miss Maddox, you 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 may be heard. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have one suggestion about how. How we can make make sure that everybody is the board on on the George Floyd accountability act in the state of Michigan. We need to get everybody a board on this because. How are we going to be able to hold our current officers accountable for what they do wrong and to make sure that we all are on board is to make sure that we all understand what is in the accountability act and another thing is we need to get we need to get party cars around the best that because we get a a blocker the buses the turning and close to the curb when you get close Thank you very much. Thank you very kindly. Is there any more? Yes, sir. Okay. We, uh, the next, uh, the next speaker will be iPhone. After iPhone, it will be former Commissioner William Davis, Joyce Jennings, and Chris Gilmore Hill. Hill. Okay. Thank you. You may be heard. Are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, awesome. Thank you for having me. My name is Chip Clark. I am a representative from DCC. We are passing through the call, making a public announcement to all of those who have been disenfranchised by a number of different organizations, people, entities across the city. If you have been negatively impacted, uh, if you have been a victim of police brutality, if you feel as though you've been raising these concerns to your elected leaders to no, to no avail, to no, to no end, we are asking that you join with us. We are building a coalition of a quarter million people to participate in the 2025 election. That is the local Detroit election. And we together will have our voices heard. I submit to you people here in Detroit that there are people who have been overtaxed 
and who are ready for a change. There are people who have who are upset that they don't have schools for their children to attend and they are ready for a change. There are people who have lost their jobs as a result of the EV mandates. They are ready for a change. There are people who don't feel like the justice system applies to them as well. And you may be under the sound of my voice. I humbly submit to you that alone your power and your complaining will mean nothing. But if we join together, my brothers and my sisters, if we come together and prepare our propositions, prepare our, our um our ordinances and we vet our own candidates and we hold public forums and we vet our elected officials and we reach the quarter million mark which we are projected to do for the next election we have already we're already adding thousands of people to our coalition uh, we have been we were at the police headquarters today we are standing with those people who have been wrongly incarcerated and we want to let you know, regardless of what your what your challenge is, we have a we have a coalition for you. It is the Detroit Community Coalition, and we are going to be meeting at the Oasis of Hope Church on the 25th of September. Thank you. Uh, next caller. You well, may hello, you may be heard. It's William Davis. How you doing, Commissioner? Okay, I'd like to start off by saying that I think that the board uh, should do some more public service announcements. Do, during the time I was on the board, I was involved in a couple of public service announcements. I, I think this board should be doing public service announcements, especially about letting the public and community know about the fact that those who act as spectators for these drag racing, that they could get tickets and that they could be cited for that. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that the community needs more information on. Because, you know, I, I think we have too much drag race and we've got too many problems going on. Uh, also, for those newer um, board members, uh, also I'm part of the, the ALPAC for Detroit Metro. And if you don't know, ALPAC is Advocates and Leaders for Police and Community Trust. Uh, you know, it's composed of community leaders, civil rights leaders, government and law enforcement uh, leaders from all across southeastern Michigan. You know, we have people from the federal government like the uh, you know, but all different aspects of the federal government, you know, be it the FBI, uh, we have uh, county people, state people, uh, local municipalities. You know, we can and should be doing more because uh, Senator Chan, she's usually on our, our meetings or a representative from our office because if each and every one of us did a little bit more, we could make Detroit a much better place to live. But especially, I think more needs to be done as it relates to officers to falsify official documentation, officers to get people in trouble. I did 34 years in the water department. If I found some, if I falsified official documentation, I would be terminated. But it seems like there's different rules for even different city employees. You know, so I, I think we should be moving towards making sure that there's greater transparency in all we do and say and make the people believe in y'all again. Thank you. Thank you very kindly. Uh, next. Good afternoon, board. Can Good you afternoon. Hear me? Yes, you may be heard. Hi, my name is Joyce Jennings. Again, I would like to thank you all for the referral, um, Commissioner Bernard, um, regarding um, our church and um, St. James Missionary Baptist Church, later named, renamed Shield of Faith and the referral to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Um, during the time that the break-in and illegal transfer of our church occurred, I was absent from my home as a result of a sexual assault that occurred in my home, and the police had told me when I met with sex crimes that I could not disturb the scene of the crime. So I temporarily relocated with my daughters to a family's friend's home. To this date, the sex crime has never been investigated. Uh, when I met with sex crimes, they had made me aware that the person who assaulted me was working under an alias name, and he's the grandson of a judge who recently passed away. And I just would like for the board and the police department to look at 
policies of the police department, especially the sex crimes unit. And it should not matter if a person is connected to a family of prominence, especially if they, as I, as I was told, he's actually a sexually assaulted many women. And when they came into sex crimes, Sergeant Ward would intimidate the women from pressing charges. I formerly served as the violence prevention coordinator when Herman Kiefer, the complex, was in place and then went on to work for the mayor's office. And as I shared with Sergeant Ward during that time, that if this family knows that he's a habitual offender, then they need to get him some help because there will be some people who don't care about who their family is and they'll take actions into their own hands. Nobody's going to care more for us as a community than we're willing to care for ourselves. Let's get together and be a blessing. Our last caller is uh, Mr. Chris Gilmer Hill. You may be heard, sir. May be heard? Yes. Right. Um, my name is Chris Gilmer Hill. I'm a lifelong resident of the city's second district. I'm uh, calling, and hopefully I'll be brief today, but once again, I'd like to raise the serious issue of the uh, police non-enforcement of our city's idling truck ordinance. This has been illegal for 10 years. For 10 years, it's been illegal in the city of Detroit for trucking companies, for any company, to leave their trucks just idling on our streets, spewing out diesel exhaust fumes for minutes and minutes and hours on end. And yet, in the entire time that, that ordinance has been on the books, the DPD has never issued a single, a single citation. They simply have chosen not to enforce this law. Uh, last week, uh, Commissioner Willie Burton raised the issue of what the, the DPD could be doing to help protect our residents in the city of Detroit from the very real problem of air pollution. Because we know in the city of Detroit, as a majority black and brown community, we're always looked at last. We're always a place that ends up with these sources of pollution, and it is literally killing us. I'd like to, again, thank Commissioner Burton for raising that issue. And I'd like to draw attention to the fact that the DPD hasn't actually given a response here. We need a concrete plan. We need, we might need in the future a stronger policy, something clear from the board to the department in order to ensure that this law gets enforced. But for now, I'm asking you to do your oversight duty and ask the board for a full report, or, or ask the DPD for a full report to this board as to why that law hasn't been enforced and what concrete steps need to be taken now to ensure that we have the right to clean air in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief. Uh, um, I, I would like to say uh, our Article 10 of the uh, BOPC bylaws prohibits threats of violence being made by the uh, public. Uh, um, you know, is I, I caution the um, those who are making public comments uh, to be careful in their language and not um, uh, talk about threats uh, to any individual or uh, to this city. And so I uh, just want to make that absolutely clear. Um, presentation to the board by the Human Resource uh, Bureau. Good afternoon through the chair. I'd be presenting the human resource report for the month of August. So for your <clears throat> departmental staffing for August, uh, the department was filled at 95%. For sworn officers, we were at 97%. We had 76 vacancies at the time. For 3%, um, so that equates to 3%. For civilians, we were at 89% with 91 vacancies. Uh, the vacancies rate was 11%. And then for police assistance, 94 with two vacancies at 6% um, for the vacancies. For sworn recruiting from the beginning of the fiscal year, July 1st through August 31st, total applicants, we had 1,465. In processing, we had 307. We had three that withdrew, 625 that was archived, 35 that was hired during that time. 20, 126 that was temporarily disqualified, 132 that was permanently disqualified, and then 237 that was awaiting MCOs um, testing. So for the MCOs testing uh, for August, for written, we had 217 that was scheduled, 101 that appeared, 65 that passed the exam, 64% passing rate, 36, 36 that fell. 36% failure rate, four rescheduled, and 112 no-shows. 
For the physical agility, we had 273 scheduled, 107 appeared. Out of that, 46 passed, 43% passing rate, 60 failed, 56% failure rate, one rescheduled, and 165 no-shows. During the month of August, we had uh, academy graduates. We had 34 students that graduated. For new hires, we had 23 sworn, 16 civilians for a total of 39 personnel new hires. For the Detroit residency information, uh, for Detroit total sworn, you had 590 uh, for Detroit. For civilians, 428 and 15 police assistants. For the non-sworn, you had 2007. Civilians, 302 and 17 police assistants out of those numbers. For the new hires, there were 16 new hires for Detroit residents and six sworn new hires for the Detroit residents. For our internship program, which ended on August the 9th, um, we had a total of 23, eight mayoral fellows, and then 15 Grow Detroit. That was here, uh, interning here in this building, and then we had some at the Detroit Public Safety Academy, about 40 over there. Uh, for attrition, sworn, we had 20 that departed, separated, 22 civilians for a total of 42. And then for your medical leave or absence and leave of absences, for sworn, uh, 15 FMLA continuous, 79 FMLA intermediate, paid parental leave, 17, one medical leave, one military leave, 145 restricted, 26 disabled, and 30 sick. For civilians, we had six on FMLA continuous, 43 on FMLA intermediate, three on paid parental leave, three on medical leave, 11 restricted, and then six was six. For the sworn personnel suspension, a total of 26. The breakout is 23 police officers, two sergeants, and one lieutenant. And then for monthly separations was a total of 20. 16 police officers, two sergeants, one detective, one commander. And then for the drop defer program, we had a total of 506 applicants, or a total of 506 that participated in the program. For the Academy students, we have a total of five classes over there right now, 143 students. Class of 37 will graduate tomorrow. And then for, we continue to receive um, members that have left the department that want to return. So we're still processing um, reinstated packages as well. Pending any questions, that concludes our presentation for today. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez. Thank you, through the chair, thank you. Thanks again, or per usual, for a great report. I have a question related to, in the packet, I don't know how many pages in it is, but it's the attrition promotional availability report. It says there are 14 budgeted mental health NPO positions and zero are filled. Can you remind me if those are newer, the ones that were recently those, approved? Those were part of the 25 that came through, I believe, the state funding. Um, so some of them were filled on the police officer side, but the, I believe it's the MPOs that you're talking about. So this is probably a lagging indicator because it's August 31st, I'm guessing? Yeah, so the um, Captain Tanya Leonard Gilbert, that's her section of the CIT, so gotcha. they are working to staff that, um, but yes. Okay. So once they go through all their process for how they're going to staff that, we'll have it. And then not, not to be facetious, but second last column on that same table manpower rate are we going to start moving away from gendering to personnel yes <laughs> thanks for the catch thank you chair. yes sir three quick questions director first of all there are 11 people suspended with pay what are they doing i mean where are they working if you know or are they at home or are they you know so I would have to get that information from disciplinary because okay, that's, all I that's have fine. is the suspension report, but I can come back to you. Okay, thank you. And you're referencing the ones that and says admin leave. Can you make leave. sure that, um, that uh, something be sent to the board regarding that, and uh, Madam Secretary, make sure that's followed up with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. The second quick question is, do we, have, do we hire people with criminal records? We follow the MCO standards, so there is a guideline for MCOs. So if it's a 
disqualification based on MCOs? No, we do not. But we look at everything from character, fitness, background, felonies, um, all of that. So it is possible for somebody to have a criminal record and join the police department? It, how are you classifying a c criminal record? Criminal record is a criminal record where they've done something and it's been expunged or they've committed some sort of crime. No, so for MCOs, if someone committed like a felony or something like that, even if it's been expunged, we are not, um, that's an MCO standard that they cannot be What hired. about like retail fraud or something like that? It, it depends Mr. on the cate category. So I can't, I would have to look at a specific package, but if that is a disqualifier for MCOs, so it's not just an isolated incident, you have to look at everything in to totality. So it is possible for somebody to be recruited that has a criminal record or has committed a crime? I'm just I'm just asking, is that possible? In their past. In their past? In their past, of course. It's possible if it's something that is approved through MCOs, but even with that, MCOs are the licensing agency. So even after we review and do all the background investigations, when MCOs come to look at it, they make a decision on each individual package. Understood. And finally, is race considered when appointments are made to the executive levels? And I guess that's a question more so for the chief, because Hayes took off. So when he comes back, I'll ask him when he comes back. I can't an answer that, but I will take that back to the, basically what you're asking is, is that a consideration, consideration yes, for right. appointments? Correct. You're done? Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, Hernandez. Thank you, through the chair. I'm going to stick with the demographic questions, um, specifically the demographic report, August 31st, 2024. Where do we capture MENA individuals? MENA is in Middle Eastern North African. So we do not have that breakdown on our report. Um, if they categorize as that, because now everything goes through um, OT Pro, then we would have to request a report from the city of Detroit. And then if that category is in there and they've classified themselves as that, then they would be able to give us that report. So most classification is based on the census, typically, which might be why there's a gap, but obviously the census, there's gonna be a, a shift in how demographics are captured. I'm just trying to see if, if we're gonna get on board with What's upcoming census? We can look into it again. Right now, you, you couldn't really tell me where our Middle Eastern population sits for sworn or civilian. So, Other like I said, white. if we pulled a report from the city, and if they have identified themselves as Middle Eastern, then we would be able to get the demographics. It of is it. the option to do so there? I doubt that, and that's really what I'm getting at. I would have to ask the city because could, could that's their program of record. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can mm -hmm. Mr. Hernandez repeat his question? What was your uh, question you just asked? So the original question was where are MENA individuals captured on that demographic report? Not, There's currently Asian, Hispanic, black, Native American even, and they're yet not, they're not captured. Historically, it's been a suppressed population from a metric perspective, and so I'm just curious if there's anything that we can do to improve that. Thank you. The report only reflects minorities and white people. They're considered white people, I, well, as you know. I, I understand how historically that has been categorized, and I'm pushing against that. Oh. That's the attempt I'm trying to do. Yep. Anything further? Uh, chair. Yes, sir. Question for uh, the HR uh, director. Uh, how many how many um, officers do we have currently that are bilingual, and are we um, tr keeping track of uh, the new recruits that are bilingual, and where and where are we having them de normally deployed? So I can tell you that that is something we're currently not keeping track of. However, I know we do have officers and civilians that do speak another language, but as far as someone who's proficient and has taken an exam, things like that, we do not have uh, a record of that. The, the, reason I, the reason I raised that is because, uh, you know, Commissioner uh, Carter and myself, 
you know, um, we both represent um, downtown Detroit, and we also, um, you know, uh, represent um, other, you know, parts of the city where um, where um, our some of our constituents are, um, you know, speak, you know, a second or a third or fourth language. But more importantly, when you talk about downtown downtown Detroit, you're looking at whether the Tigers have a home game or the Lions have a home game and things of that nature, you know, um, you have, uh, you know, a lot of people that's coming into our districts, um, you know, like to know how many offices do we have on the force that are bilingual and are they, you know, do we have a, um, um, those officers, you know, deployed in the downtown area in portion of District 5 and also District 6 and 3rd Precinct, right? Mr. Chair, can I ask Deputy Chief Hayes the question? Uh, yeah, it's once. Uh, okay, we, you good? You good, uh, Commissioner? Commissioner Burton, are you good? Um, I was waiting to hear from the... <laughs> that, that's all I'm asked then? Yeah. Okay. All right. say, say. Oh, I did. I did answer the question. He asked okay. if we tracked it. So, I, like I said, I know we have officers and civilians that may speak a second language, but as far as tracking, meaning proficient, taking an exam, showing their proficiency, things like that, no, we're not tracking it. All right. Thank you. Would it be something that you will, your office will be considering doing going forward? Well, I can look into it. All right. Chief Hayes, the question while you were gone was, is race considered for executive promotions? Uh, through the chair, absolutely not. Uh, knowledge, skills, ability, integrity, ethics, uh, a commitment to this organization and this community, uh, and a desire and willingness to lead are the contributing factors uh, in the role or being elevated in this agency, and uh, race is not a part of that, sir. And I was just wondering, why did we keep the demographics if it's not considered? And sorry, if you can circle, if you can bring me up to the. We have a breakdown of different executives and their race. And I was just wondering if it's not considered, then why do we have the demographic printout? No. I'm sorry. Uh, through the chair, I believe that's what the HR uh, director provided you. I, I'm not sure the, why that metric was captured in that fashion, but to be elevated to any of those ranks, uh, race is, I, I just double down, race is not a contributing factor or sex. Okay. Or Thank gender, you. or religion, or any of that sort. <laughs> if you were to say something else, the chief would probably you probably be looking for a new job. <laughs> Been one down. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do the chair. Do you want to reference the EOC? <laughs> do I want to reference? As to his question, he asks, "Why do we track it?" Yeah, we do get um, questions and inquiries on the demographics of the department, and so we do track it as yeah, far as the demographics. There's a, Thank you. A, a, essentially, there's a federal commission that oversees any kind of HR analytics and, and practice, if you will, and any federal contractor typically has to report out certain demographic information, hence why you have to capture it. I'm speaking in general. I don't work for the city. <laughs> I don't work for city HR or DPD, but um, generally across Where? most institutions and agencies and so forth Schools, and corporations, you have to do that. Where? Thanks, Commissioner. All right. All right, thank you. All right, so I see here that we had um, uh, resigned on the charges of approximately five people. Um, are you um, uh, ensuring, as we had the discussion earlier? Absolutely. Okay, and what was my question? Your question was, are we tracking or inputting the information in in calls that we need to when someone separates, uh, disciplinary, or has any type of um, negative connotation that goes to it? So when other law enforcement agency comes, they will actually have to report that information. I like that. Good answer. <laughs> I'll stand. <laughs> All right. Uh, there being no more questions, uh, thank you very much for the detailed report, and thank you for making sure you get that to M calls. Yes, I their requirement is three days. Uh, as far as from our perspective, that's one of the, you say it's required in three days? Their requirement is three days, yes. Three days, so that's, that's good to know too. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, let's go to uh, the board, uh, report from the board secretary.
The incoming information today is special order responding to mental health crisis and the Office of Chief Investigators weekly inventory report for the dates September 7, 2024 through September 13, 2024. The announcements are the next meeting is Thursday, September 26 at 3 p.m. here at Detroit Public Safety Headquarters. And the next community meeting is Thursday, October 10th, 2024, at 6.30 p.m., which will be in the third precinct at Goodwill Industries Career Center in Detroit. Um, and I apologize to the board. There should have been committee meetings listed as well for October 1st. There will be... Um, a citizens complaint committee meeting at 1 p.m., 3 p.m., my apology, as well as a policy committee meeting at 5 p.m. the same day. My apologies to the board. Not not a problem. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any new business? To the chair. Yes, sir. Uh, at this time, I, I noticed looking at the calendar that um, uh, apparently, the third precinct um, during the time of the NACO conference, we're going to end up missing that. So I'd like to move the third precinct community relations meeting to the um, board meeting to the third week um, of the of the month. So so we as a board can still be able to honor um, those uh, men and women. Of, of that precinct, but also um, to hear their report as well. Um, okay, motion, motion, motion made by Commissioner Burton to move the um, third precinct meeting to the third uh, Thursday, uh, and second by Commissioner Carter. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Yep. So NACO, we, we leave for travel October 12th. Correct. This is October 10th. Yeah, it doesn't impact it. It doesn't impact. Right. I was going to make the same point. So. Okay. For us to move it to the third week, that means we'll be traveling from NACO, and we couldn't make the third precinct meeting. And we also don't know the availability of Goodwill Industries Center on right. the third Thursday of the month. Which, how can we make oh. it from? And make that so, so let's vote it down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, um, so uh, no second. The, it, she seconded already. Uh, did we had a discussion. Oh. All in favor say aye. I, 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 re I remove it for now. Okay, retract it. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Once the motion has been stated by the chair, can yeah. that be removed, uh, withdrawn by individual member? You can, however, ask for unanimous consent to, for the board to withdraw it. Um, do we have unanim unanimous consent to redraw with the draw? Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Uh, motion second. to uh, motion to adjourn by Commissioner Hand Hernandez and second by Commissioner uh, uh, Bernard. All in favor say aye. aye. Any you ain't got to vote. Uh, any discussion? Uh, anyone opposed? The motion is carried. This meeting is adjourned.